When I get access to a new Google Ads account with Pmax in it, I ignore 99% of the settings. And when I start auditing the Pmax campaign, I only look at three things to begin with. The very first one is the channel performance report. Go look at yours right now. If you see more than 10% of your spend going to display a video, that's a red flag but it's an easy one, it's a big one. The rest is a lot more detailed, especially around new customer acquisition that's used wrong by most, and Google encourages you to use it. So let's get started on how you can audit your own Pmax campaigns. Now, there's areas to audit. Let's start with the big things that move the needle. This is the channel performance report. So when you go in here and go to insights and reports and then channel performance, if it's not in your account yet, reach out to Google and request it. Otherwise, it should be there very, very, very soon. And if you're watching this by 2026, it has to be in every single account. And that's me saying has to, not everybody else. This up here is super confusing and not necessary. Go down, go down, go down, go down, go down to where it says channel distribution. Here you didn't click on columns and get all the stuff away. We don't need it. Then what you click on is you click on performance, you get cost, you get conversions, you get conversion value, conversion value by cost. If you measure your account by CPA, then say CP, CPA. Well then go down and it's lovely format. Now it's much more usable. The way that you then look at this is first and foremost, you can take the segment away and just do none and see, okay, what are we spending on search and the different channels? In this case, it's actually doing pretty well. It's not spending nearly anything on discover or on display Gmail, YouTube or maps. So far so good. Now you want to click on segment and say ads using product data because this will allow you to say, okay, inside of search, we're spending 8,600 on ads using product data. That means shopping ads. So 8,000 is shopping, 4,000 is search. That's important for you to know. That's important for something for you to pay attention to. That's the first thing I go into, search versus shopping spend. And then the second thing is I go in and look at, is there waste in display and video? Right now, there's nothing in here and it's super nice. It is a little bit of a nice thing to, to be able to see, okay, if you're looking at display or if you're looking at YouTube, how much spend is actually ads using product data versus ads not using product data. Because if you go into display and you say ads using product data and you, let's just say it's like, it's higher than this. Let's say it's 5% of your spend and it performs okay, but you, and you spend a lot of time adding assets to it and you can look, hey, display is doing great. But by looking at this, you can actually see 90% of the spend is just responsive display ads where it's just automatically put in the, the products and it doesn't use your assets at all. So that's important to keep track of. The same, the same thing can be done with YouTube and Gmail, et cetera. The last thing you also wanna look at is Gmail spikes. Most e-commerce will not have this issue, but you might have something that you wanna do here. There are a couple of things that you find. Like if you find that there's 90% of the spend is in shopping, here's like 60, 40 ish. Yeah, 60, 40. Then if 90% of the spend is in shopping and you wanna do full Pmax, then the goal here is to create better asset grouping and better headlines. Better headlines means the search will convert better and get more spend. If you find a lot of waste in display and video, or a lot of spend without a lot of conversion value. You want to make sure that you don't just look at this just right now, this instant, because sometimes there's spikes in, in display and video. You have two choices here. You can remove image and video assets, which I recommend if there's waste in there. You can also improve image and video assets. And my opinion for e-commerce, you have nothing to do with spending on display and video inside Pmax. It's a bad idea. Now the last one is of course, Gmail spikes. You can either <laughs> live with it or you can stop using Pmax. So that's the channel performance review. The next one I wanted to show you is if you click on search terms, again, this is something that's really, really nice that's come in here. So now we're looking at search terms. And the first thing you wanna do is say, okay, this is 9,000 that's known search terms. And then there's 13,526, or sorry, three in this, and then in total in the campaign. This is also telling you how much goes into search across search and shopping. There's no way to know whether or not it's a search or shopping search term, which can be a little bit difficult to work with, but there's definitely some things that you should you look at here. Right now, off the bat, this you can see in the data, you don't even have to look at what the actual term is. This is a branded term. It converts much better than the rest. And the same thing down here and the same thing down here. CPC is decent, the half of the actual CPC in here, but this one is like, actually higher than the average it means we're overspending on what I can reveal to you is the core brand term inside of inside of shopping. It's a bad idea. We want to try to look at this. So again, if I just try to go in and I try to say the term here and you will not be able to see it because you're not supposed to know who the client is. So right now I'm looking at everything that it has uh, the brand term in there. And then so we're like, okay, a thousand euro cost at 558 ROAS. 
and 064. If I then say it doesn't contain, so I just want to see what the performance is without it. So 074, 8700, 226. Let me go back. So that's 0 0.7 and 0 0.64. That I swear to you, we can get down. You can always get brand term spend down. So this is one of the first things I look at is brand versus non-brand spend. So I can make sure are we overspending on brand terms? And this gives me validity to pull this out of Pmax, which is not supposed to be Pmax from the first place. <laughs> so this allows me to pull it out, get in a standard shopping campaign where I can lower the spend on it or spend more deliberately on it. Very important. The other thing I would like you to do when it comes to uh, search terms in here is of course, like you can just go like, okay, conversion value divided by cost. If it's hitting 261, then let's say anything below 0.5 and say, okay, how poorly is this performing? Just like a normal search term report. 4,000 out of 13,000 spend has no conversions. Okay, that's not good, but be careful with over excluding. Like I like to try to go back a little bit further so we can try to see, okay, now it's 4,000 out of 13,000. Okay, still the same, but is there anything in here that goes together? Is there anything like any of the words that are the same? that always things we can actually uh, lower and stuff like that. Just be careful you don't over exclude. That's something to be really, really careful. With. Now, the third thing that I look at is ad set performance because in here, headlines are the most important ones to review. Let me just jump into an account and show you. So now we're inside an account and Google go away. So here, the first thing you wanna do is you go in and you say type because all this is just annoying. No, you go into performance and you say type. Uh, you click on headline. Now we can see the headlines and we can see how they convert and we can see how many clicks they have. This allows us to go in and say, okay, if these are all the headlines we have, we can remove the bottom ones that don't get a lot of clicks. We can remove the ones that don't convert as well. So in here, we just want to add, we want to add CTR and conversion rate. So if we look at this, then like this has a 4% conversion uh, CTR. That needs to go away immediately. And it's getting quite a bit of the impressions. So that needs to go away. It also converts horribly. Then there's this one, decent CTR, but bad conversion rate out again. So you go through, just remove the headlines that don't work and add uh, that don't work and improve on the ones that are actually working and add net new headlines. I have another video on how to create uh, RSA and, and search headlines. That's different. You might want to split this up into different asset groups and stuff like that. This is only one asset group, so it's not supposed to be done like this. And then on the images and videos, honestly, rarely important. Volume just isn't there. The last thing I want to review in a Pmax campaign is the asset groups. What do you do? Clear campaigns, we clear an asset group. Now, if you're running only feed like feed only uh, pmax then you don't need to worry about asset groups grouping products together in asset groups do not impact the performance at all if you're running a full pmax campaign with all assets then it's worth spending time structuring your asset groups however in 90 percent, 98 percent of the pmax campaigns that i see then there's no significant spend in display of video so i don't spend a lot of time on this part with images and videos however when pmax has a good split between search and shopping ads then improving your headline and description assets can have a significant impact impact. Pmax finds ad copy from two places, your page title, like dynamic search ads does, that's like your SEO titles. And then they use the headlines and descriptions that you provide. Now your page titles generally work well for long tail searches. Like if somebody has a search for dry shampoo and conditioner for curly hair, then if we just add a headline manually, then we might just add it as shampoo for curly hair. But if you have a product for dry shampoo conditioner combo curly for curly hair, then the title will most likely be best dry shampoo and conditioner for curly hair. And that page title will be your best headline and most likely convert the best. Now let's take another example. The search is shampoo for curly hair. And this is where your headline assets should start to come in. Your asset group should have three to eight headlines focused on shampoo for curly hair, like tan top shampoo for curly hair, best curled finding shampoo, shampoo made for curly hair, get perfect curls with our shampoo, curly hair, try this shampoo, professional shampoo for curls. I don't know if that's going to be in there, but this is where Pmax's automated headlines can work great for long tail keywords, but the big money keywords need you to buckle up and actually write some good ad copy. And no, no, nobody actually likes to do this anymore, but this is where it works. And this is where asset groups come into place by grouping assets, headlines and descriptions with the products 
and the URLs, then they should target together and work together so you can write better ad copy for the right landing pages. With Pmax, you can see how this can become a very cumbersome process to keep updated across many, 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 many asset groups if you have thousands of products. But in my opinion, that's why Pmax isn't the right choice in all cases. Now, chapter two in this is things to be careful with. And I have two particular things, the new customer acquisition feature and negative keywords. Let's start off with looking at the new customer acquisition feature. So the way it is, is that we're looking in here, we're saying customer acquisition, bid equally for new and existing customers. I'm just gonna go through this rather briefly in a couple of weeks, there's a much more in-depth video coming out on it, but I wanted to tell you in the context of Pmax, what to be careful with. The way that it works is that average value currently is 89 bucks. Uh, so what we do is we identify when a conversion comes from an existing customer. It means that we go in and we say we have an audience segment and when they're in that audience segment, it's an existing customer. Pmax uses this to know when a conversion is from a new or existing customer. What we then do is we add an extra value, like let's say 30 euros. And then whenever it's an existing customer that makes a purchase, then the value is listed as 89. But when a new customer comes in, it's listed as whatever the purchase value was plus 30. This added value skews the bidding algorithm to value keywords, products, and channels that bring in more new customers higher than others. Overall, I think that this is a good feature and it can help you focus on existing customers. However, there are three things that you need to know. Number one is that the feature is only as good as the data you give Google. So in this case, we're only showing the purchasers that have actually converted like the purchase in here. So this is based on a conversion data. Now you want to upload your all your existing customer list with all the possible ways that Google can identify that this is an existing customer. Because every unidentified existing customer that buys something on your site will default to a new customer. Again, if Google can see that it's an existing customer, it will default it to a new customer. This is not good or bad, it's just how it works and something you need to be pay attention to. The second thing is that the conversion value gets added to your reported total conversion value. So if I do this where I add 30 euros here, it gets added to the conversion value you see in your account every single time Google identifies a new customer, it will add this 30 euros. Now let me try to show you the math. So we just have an example here where we have with uh, without added value and with the added new customer value. So we have the same amount of conversions, 3,500, but the new customers, the conversion value go from 276 to 451. The existing customers are 1,500 of, they're still the same value. The conversion value you'll see in an account with the exact same numbers without the new customer acquisition feature enabled and with the new customer acquisition feature enabled is 395 versus 570. The reason why it's shown like this, because I asked the product manager, why the heck do we do it like this? It's kind of confusing. It's because it's the value the smart bidding uses to bid for. If you were to try to go back and review ROAS versus the target you set at any given time, it's important for Google to show you exactly the value that it was bidding for. And this was the cleanest setup in their opinion. That's the explanation from the Pmax product managers. And it makes sense to a degree. Personally, I would have preferred to get, have this value completely separate because it really messes with your ability to review trends in your data. And if you ever change a new customer acquisition value, which I recommend you do, then you can't really compare it year over year. The third thing, and you just, you just have to know this, this effectively lowers your ROAS target. It's a shame that Google doesn't explain this better because they actually do inside smart bidding exploration. They outright show you what your ROAS target becomes. They don't do that here. Adding fake values to new customers essentially lowers the ROAS the smart bidding is allowed to hit when it thinks it's getting new customers. I would love to see this much more, much better in the interface uh, like it does for smart bidding exploration. But instead we get this slightly confusing view where it's like, hey, you want to in add an incremental conversion value for new customers, you go like, yeah, cool, super. I would love that because I want more new customers and it doesn't really like, this literally just lowers your ROAS target and especially if you don't have good data for it. What's also important is that is what new customer acquisition doesn't do. It doesn't lower your cost for brand terms. That's a completely different conversation. I've gone into depth in the video that comes out in a few, a few weeks. And it doesn't lower your spend on retargeting audiences. If it's a new customer, it will still go crazy on retargeting. The second thing to be very much on the lookout for, and this is in a video I created a few months ago, is just like negative keywords and why I believe most advertisers should remove all negative keywords versus adding too many. And the same applies to Pmax. When you run a full Pmax, there's another 
aspect that comes into place versus search because is this a bad search term for my search campaigns or for shopping? With the way Pmax is structured, like I showed you, you can't see if a search term performs poorly on search, shopping, or on both. So it's tough to really exclude anything because if you exclude a search term that's performing on the margins, it might perform great on search, it might perform great on shopping, but not on both. So it's really tough to exclude anything with confidence. Now, then there's a couple of things when we come walk into the small stuff of a Pmax campaign. Let's move into some of the small stuff. So search themes is one of those things that I think is very, very, very interesting to talk about because a lot of people think they're keywords, but they're not. They are just a way to tell Pmax to go in a direction, but if performance doesn't follow it or your products have nothing to do with those searches, uh, search themes don't have an, an effect. There's two, mainly two use cases to use search terms. There's new products that need to target keywords that do, that just don't do it so far. It's a lot of work for something that Google does pretty well by itself. So I don't think it's I don't think it's that helpful. And then there's if you identify gaps in keywords you're not targeting. We work with hundreds of accounts and savvy across different markets, and we do these analysis all the time. And in 95% of cases, there is a reason why Google isn't targeting a certain search term, and it's just because performance isn't there. So. I just think it's overkill to, to spend a lot of time on search terms, to be honest. Then there's first party data. I think it's important to make sure you add the right first party data in everything we do. I don't think it has a massive, uh, massive effect on day-to-day -day performance, but I think it's something you should do. Another thing I just wanted to walk through is settings because it's, 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 I used to say it was super simple to run Pmax, but it's actually getting quite complicated. So campaign status makes sense. Uh, comparison serving service makes sense if you're in Europe. Feeds make sense. Store locations all make sense. Budget is also simple. Conversion goals. I usually recommend having them set to account uh, just because campaign specific. If you ever change your actual conversion goal or do something there, it, it can kind of mess with everything. And with that being said, this is the group purchases. It's typically not a big deal, but that's something to look at. Bidding we've already gone through in terms of customer retention. I typically, I, I cannot for the life of me figure out what the use case here is, where I would spend more on re-engaging lapsed customers. It's just, it sounds like such an insane uh, niche <laughs> issue that I don't think there's a lot to be in there. Value roles, most of, the, of us in e-commerce do not do anything when it comes to this. So I wouldn't touch that, to be honest, unless you have a very particular thing. Then everything else becomes just uh, just basic. Brand guidelines are really cool. You can put in what the business name, name is. And very, very soon, there's something that comes out with uh, brand guidelines. So you can actually put the prompt in there to describe your brand guidelines for when Google writes ads for you. That's pretty cool. That's going to be super duper nice. Campaign URL is normal. Device is normal. Brand exclusions. You want to exclude brand. It's just like it. 99% of cases you have to do it. So if you're in doubt, you probably should. Age exclusions. I recommend don't touching it. Third party measurement. If you don't know what it is, don't spend time working on it. When it comes to campaign structure, I have just very, very few rules. Fewer campaigns are much better. Too broken up, you have too little data in each uh, in each campaign because Pmax doesn't actually speak together. So the fewer campaigns, the better. The second rule I have is only split into more campaigns if you are going to change the budget or change the row target. One of those two things, that's it. I'm not going to go into much more detail about advanced campaign structures because honestly, I don't think advanced campaign structures work with Pmax. And I firmly believe that standard shopping is better when you start venturing into more advanced campaign structures. The benefit of Pmax is combining search and shopping into a single campaign for easy management. Once you split, start splitting these into multiple campaigns across price competitiveness, margins, categories or any other thing, then you lose the value that Pmax brings, which is simplicity and data aggregation. So that's how I audit Pmax. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you're into practical PPC insights that you can actually help you, then subscribe. I share tips, breakdowns, and call out what's working and what's not. No fluff, just the stuff that you can use every single week.